At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water Water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education, and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 7, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator, and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor, as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord, and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically, and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. 
The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits, and so they would be given a large ladle, and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been, and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare, so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley, and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, Cupbearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cupbearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cupbearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cupbearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cupbearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cupbearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cupbearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number 2, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale, and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number 1, Alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out, and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. At number 10, Groom of the Stool. There were a lot of really horrible jobs back in the Middle Ages. I mean, these people literally took any task you could think of and turned it into an actual profession. From fetching water from the nearest stream to handing drinks to people, everyone had some kind of job. But with that said, some jobs were worse than others, and here's one of them. The Groom of the Stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry a commode around at all times, waiting for the king to do his business, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. You know you're well off when you hire someone just to take care of your bodily business. Talk about a crappy job. At number 9, kissing sheets. 
For thousands of years, one of the biggest threats that people of royal or high status had to worry about was being taken out by their enemies. Monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies as it was one of the most common methods of offing someone. So they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed every morning. They would kiss the pillows, the sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning his clothes too, as well as his sons, and so they would be tested for poison before they got dressed. Henry VIII was really out here providing employment for just about every weird task you could think of. Before we carry on talking about some of the strangest professions from back in the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Leech Collector. Back in the Middle Ages, things were still quite underdeveloped, like medicine for example. In our last video, I told you guys about alchemists who, at the time, were pretty much the ones who sought out cures for different ailments. Because science wasn't really known to them back then, they tried using whatever they could find to create cures, and one of the most common things that were used in medicine were leeches. Now, as we've learned by now, anything could become a job in the Middle Ages, and so gathering leeches became a profession. What's even weirder than the fact that finding leeches was someone's job is the method of how they collected those bad boys. Leech collectors would wade into the water with bare legs and wait for the leeches to come to them. They would swish around and try to gather as many leeches on their body as possible. They would then get out of the water and pry the leeches off, putting them into a bucket and selling them to people in town like barber surgeons and other medical professionals. Now I can't say I've ever had a leech on me, so I don't really know what it feels like, but I can imagine that it's an uncomfortable feeling, so to have a bunch of them all over you must have been a nightmare. At number 7, Fuller. Wool was a very important part of life for people back in the Middle Ages. They were able to make all sorts of things out of it, and because it was waterproof because of the natural oils in the wool, it made processing the wool quite easy. But soon people found out that whatever they made out of the wool ended up being quite coarse and frayed easily. They figured that if they removed the oil from the wool, then it would make the overall product a little nicer, which it did, but the oil removing process definitely wasn't pleasant. Back then, in order to get the oils off wool, people called fullers would process the wool by pouring stale urine over it and then stomping on it. They needed some kind of alkaline solution to dissolve the oils and urine was the best and most abundant solution. What makes this extra gross though is the fact that when it came to big batches of wool, they would have needed the urine of a bunch of people to get the job done. So that means that the fuller would have been sloshing around in the urine of like half the town. Gross. At number 6, Ostiary. In the Middle Ages, religion played a big part in the lives of the people, and there were actually quite a few jobs centered around having something to do with the church. This is true with Ostiaries, who worked almost like a secretary for the church. This position was normally held by a man who wanted to move up in the church's hierarchy. He was basically doing a menial task to butt kiss his way to the top. Ostiaries were tasked with being kind of like a church bouncer. They would make sure that unbaptized people didn't come into the church during certain times, and they would also man the doors during baptisms. This profession was based on the Roman habit of having a slave guard the doors of their master's house. At number 5, Bear Leader. Now here's a really strange job from the Middle Ages, which sounds both terrifying but also kind of cool. Back in the Middle Ages, blood sports were all the rage. Many of the monarchs who ruled during this time were obsessed with watching blood sports, which honestly kind of explains a lot, but that's besides the point. One of the most popular blood sports was bear baiting, which involved making a pack of dogs fight a bear. Sounds gruesome, but it also begs the question, well, where did you get the bear? Well, that's where bear leaders came into play. For bear leaders, their whole job was to lead bears from village to village so that they could participate in blood sports. Now it sounds super dangerous because, well, we're talking about a big bear, but imagine how much of a flex that would be to say, yeah, I wrangle bears for a living. Like, how cool would that be? Now that's something to put in your Tinder bio. At number four, the piss prophet. 
As we all know, medicine wasn't all that advanced in the Middle Ages. There were no actual doctors, and the people you would have visited if you were feeling unwell were the same people who doubled as barbers, so I don't know how accurate their medical diagnosis would be. In medieval England, people didn't really know much about health, and many people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. The people who collected people's urine samples were called piss prophets, and they had their own criteria for determining what was going on in someone's body based on their urine. According to the piss prophets, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then it meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were because medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. At number three, Muckraker. In our last video about unusual jobs from the Middle Ages, I told you guys about a job where people had to clean up human waste with ladles and then transport it elsewhere to keep the town clean. But there's another profession along those same kind of lines that I'd like to tell you about. Muckrakers were the people who were responsible for cleaning waste off the streets in whatever town they were in. You see, back then, people kind of just disposed of their waste wherever they pleased. But since this waste, like human and animal excrement, rotting food, and entrails had nowhere to go and kind of just sat around the streets, you can just imagine how disgusting that must have been. So that's where muckrakers came in. These were brave people who basically rode around town, collecting waste off the ground and throwing it into carts to then be transported out of the city. As horrible as this job may sound though, these people actually made a lot of money. Muckrakers could make in 11 days the same amount as another laborer makes in 6 months. Would you do this job if it made you rich? And number 2, Arming Squires. I've talked about squires in a previous list about medieval knights, and if you've watched that video, then you might be familiar with how unpleasant the life of a squire could be. At a certain point in their training, a squire would be tasked with basically being an assistant to a knight, and a lot of their assistance was guided towards the knight's armor and weaponry. In the Middle Ages, arming squires were given the task of maintaining the knight's armor. So this meant that they had to make sure that the armor was clean and properly attached to the knight's body. This job was so serious that sometimes the arming squire would have to run out into the battlefield in the middle of a fight to tend to their knight's armor, which meant that they were risking their lives for a couple hunks of metal. And finally, at number one, peer finders. Now I think this last job on our list must be one of the worst ones by far. We've talked about how people harvested leeches, cleaned waste off the streets, and stomped on urine-soaked wool, but imagine if your job was just to go around the town and pick up as much dog poop as you possibly could. This was basically what people called peer finders would do. Dog poop was essentially used as a drying agent by tanneries to make leather for book binding. This was a lot of people's full-time jobs, but imagine how crappy this job would have been. I'll see myself out. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full 
trial. It's wild to look back at a knight and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand. And it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No, thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. 
Chasseur de rats. I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or, you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you've probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this. Thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the Holy Land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh, many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. And this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe, as it were. So, not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The gong farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often 
pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The rat trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad. And number 10, shaming parades. If you've watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked, while someone behind her is ringing a bell chanting shame. Ding ding ding. Shame. It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's kind of human nature at this point, and obviously back then, they didn't have social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary, but the one thing that stayed consistent was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the streets and forced to drink the beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded, and it was quite the spectacle. Now, would you rather experience this or being cancelled on social media? And number 9, Cemetery Fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games, or read, or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall, or to your friend's house? Well, if you lived in the Dark Ages in Europe, you would go to the place where everyone goes for fun. The cemetery. Yeah, you're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately, they're not corpse husbands. Although, corpse, if you're watching, hit me up. I love you. Anyways, back in the Dark Ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then, people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, and it was almost like the equivalent to going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the Dark Ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. Before we carry on talking about the weirdest parts of life from the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number 8, Judging Tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with the idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS, and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the Dark Ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and the frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been different kinds of tears, which they called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overwhelmed with emotion that they would be moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it wasn't disturbing anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And number seven, soccer. These days, people regard soccer, or football, as a modern European sport, and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around for a lot longer than you might think. Soccer was first played back in the Dark Ages, however, it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then, the sport didn't really have a name, and there were no rules either. The only thing people followed when playing this game was the objective of winning. Back then, you were allowed to win by any means necessary besides deliberately offing people 
of course. Back then, soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody, and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players, so it was really a free-for-all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314, King Edward II banned the game, decreeing, quote, on pain of imprisonment, such games to be used in the city in future. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would really be intense if it hadn't. And number six, too much poop. Here's a real downside to being a knight in the medieval era. While we've been taught that knights were these amazing, brave, chivalrous men that would rescue a princess and live happily ever after, the reality is they were a bunch of dudes on a muddy battlefield with poor hygiene that were literally pooping themselves to death. Many knights who embarked on crusades had a lot of parasites and diseases, and one illness that proved most problematic was dysentery. Dysentery is an illness that basically causes super poops due to a parasite. So these knights were out trying to win back the Holy Lands while their tom toms were throwing up gang signs and getting mad rumbly on the battlefield. It is believed that these knights contracted dysentery through drinking tainted water, and because medicine was basically a myth at this point, once you contracted dysentery, you could basically kiss your life and your stomach contents goodbye. The most famous case of death by butt explosion was from the Seventh Crusade where Louis IX had contracted dysentery and had his pants cut because he was tired of having to pull them down every time he felt a rumbly in his tumbly. It all sounds like such a terrible way to go and a serious downside of being a knight. And number five, unicorns and Jesus. The thing about the Dark Ages is that it was full of superstition and mythology. Within this period of time, there was a lot of confusion when it came to religion as paganism and the rise of Christianity were both hot topics. Many times superstitions and mythology from paganism made its way into religious beliefs of Christians and things were known to get a little weird. Take for example the unicorn and how it was incorporated into the Christian beliefs of the Dark Ages. It is believed that a mistranslation of what is thought to have been an ox is what brought unicorns into Christianity. Because of this mistranslation, the Bible likened Jesus to a unicorn. Since it was in the religious text, people in the Dark Ages sort of just ran with it, and so they started incorporating the unicorn into many religious artworks. To further this whole thing, they made up a superstition that only innocent maidens were allowed to touch unicorns, and they even used unicorns to come up with a rather uncomfortable allegory of Christ entering Mary's womb. This unicorn thing was also fueled by the Vikings at one point, as during the Middle Ages, Vikings were known to con people into buying narwhal tusks marketed as real unicorns corn horns. And number four, divorce by combat. Back in the dark ages, if you wanted a divorce, you had to be willing to fight for it. Literally. In medieval Germany, couples would take to the ring and settle their disputes and it was quite the showdown. Trial by combat was the common way of settling arguments back then, but when a husband and wife were fighting, things were a little more interesting than having just an all-out brawl. During these divorce by combat proceedings, the husband had to stand in a hole with his hands tied behind his back, while the wife ran around in circles with a bag full of rocks. I don't really see how this settled anything, but who am I to question the methods of the Dark Ages? And number three, Animal Court. I think that one of the weirdest things about life in the Middle Ages was their legal cases. As I told you, their divorce proceedings were literally a trial by combat. They also found some bizarre ways of trying to see if someone was accused of witchcraft, and that was pretty dark, but the strangest court battles involved animals. Animals were sometimes put on trial back in the Dark Ages. All animals, from livestock to pets and even insects, were not safe from the law and they would be put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. According to records from the Dark Ages, at least 85 animals were put on trial for a number of reasons. Pigs were the ones who were put on trial the most for chewing off people's body parts and even eating children. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial and found guilty of an unnatural crime of laying an egg. And even unwanted rats were put on trial and received strongly worded letters demanding that they leave the premises. The most bizarre case though involved a donkey who went through a legal trial and actually won. This donkey became the victim of unwanted advances but was deemed innocent because someone declared her to be a quote, virtuous and well-behaved animal, end quote. These people had just way too much time on their hands. And number two, yummy people. As you could probably imagine for medieval knights, desperate times called for desperate measures. Oftentimes during battles, supplies would run out and knights would be left dealing with starvation on top of everything else they were going through. 
This proved to be quite a huge problem during the Crusades because after supplies and food started running out, people got desperate and started seeing each other as snacks, if you know what I mean. Some of the poorest crusaders resorted to eating people to get them through the journey to take back the Holy Lands, and as you can imagine, it was a pretty gory sight to see. Knights back then recalled seeing enemy forces on spits and dismembered people lying around in plain view. It was rough being a knight back then, and the amount of shortcuts and strategies people came up with just to survive got real dark real fast. And finally, at number one, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage. But later on in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. They would do the good old brown chicken brown cow, boom boom pow, omg wow, which would have been a positive or a negative experience depending on the circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching a live show on a Fifty Shades of Grey, and Joe would be like, you'll bet. Yes, that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that their marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything actually happened. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow. <laughs> OMG wow. Which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But, uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate, that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, 
it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number 7. No objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flesh out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, Accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number six, shoes. Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the Aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened. Happened, you had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the 
package, well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually, veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that? You know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork work side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Right. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place, like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's right was something even more horrific. The droit de seigneur was a feudal right that existed in medieval Europe that gave the lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village even if they didn't want to get married, it was ridiculous. However, late middle age and renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dois de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Traite de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom. And Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away, like nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight, stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language. 
while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stonemasons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Yeah, they're backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I got to drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff from growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services, especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These are the lowest class of people and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on, a three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four, 
Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you the school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder! Go! Go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more. All moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths. That's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think this story is made up per se. No one would make this up. It's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it! Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way. We're all dancing. Okay, number 10, location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons, where a castle was built really, really Really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Pradjemski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain. Rain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. 
No. I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you want to do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmet and cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all oh, these frogs would just ribbit about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They'd pluck a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they'd glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my feathers? I'm naked! Just awful. Weird times. Weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life this wouldn't actually happen, you wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed, but this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages, and what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know, they developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to perceive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably and if you didn't, it was looked down on, but then again, you were also dead, so what does that matter? But it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death, the victim, who was stabbed in the head, always had like a calm expression, which is like, yeah, this is fine. It's a flesh wound. Number seven. A jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow, as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers, and acrobats. Edward II, for instance, in 1306, had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic. But soon jesters became employed full time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical Farter. Brain in. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas he would perform and earn a grant of the land, so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick witted in order to maintain the love of their masters. However, if they went too far. Off with her head. Tribule, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number six, gazing out of windows. Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the lord was away, for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noblewomen, for instance, had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on crusades Crusades, war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially with, in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages, but this is kind of what it looked like. Number 5. Shotgun Weddings Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky, and also 
not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. Number four, the mystery of Ludlow Castle. Beyond weird weddings, war, and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marion de la Bruyere, and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night, he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number three, secret passageways. If I am ever. <laughs> Ever in my life, able to actually afford a house. We'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library. Like both. Both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your walls. They could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corfe Castle during the Siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number two, where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos, and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too, and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Except for the lions, they did pretty well. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of like, a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, this is a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and 
everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard, anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So, you can paint the picture in your head, it's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. Number 10. The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like, you're already the first, man. You don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay and five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, The Crusades. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the east. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings. 
the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, no, no. We need fear. Way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right that down. Except women. They don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried. In a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathers, were peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, AKA pestilence, AKA the great mortality, or simply known as the plague. Single-handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number four, Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, 
leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh yeah, I play uh, mob football in Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be or not to be 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery.